Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Indus University, I take this opportunity to welcome you all. In an era where there is a mad rush to establish one's identity, which is different from others, an identity which is unique, an identity that you will be remembered for, it is prudent to say that we have lost our way. With social media allowing us to be whatever we want, rather than what we really are, Humanity has concealed itself behind a facade. As Oscar Wilde has said, most people are other people. Their thoughts are someone else's opinions. Their lives a mimicry, their passion a quotation. It takes enlightened individuals to introspect in order to find who they really are. Siddhartha became Lord Buddha by questioning who he was, and it took Lord Krishna to resolve Arjun's identity crisis. Indian culture has been built on a strong foundation of individuals who did not attempt to be others, but embarked on a journey to find themselves. Today's distinguished lecture is an extension of this journey to answer who are we. It is a quest for national identity. To assist us on this quest for national identity, we are privileged to have a celebrated personality amongst us Dr. Subramanian Swami, who is a member of parliament. He is an eminent politician, economist, and thinker. Indus University is privileged to have such an eminent academic personality with a huge political presence. Today, I am sure his words of wisdom will be an excellent exposure to a world we try to understand and assimilate. On the dais, I welcome our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Subramanian Swami, Member of Parliament, our esteemed Guest of Honor, Sri Prakash Jalan, Chairman Basant Group, Dr. Nagesh Bandari, President in this University, Srimati Ritu Bandari, Associate President in this University, Sri Malik Dave, Member of Board of Governance in this University, and Dr. M. Muruganan, Executive President in this University. I also take this opportunity to welcome renowned industrialists, academicians, faculty colleagues, parents, and students from various universities across Gujarat. May I now request Dr. Nagesh Bandari, President of Indus University, for his introductory remarks on this occasion. Sir, I welcome you. Suprabhat, Namaskar. Aap sabka Indus University mein swagat hai. और आज हमारे बीच में हैं हमारे मुख्य अतिथि डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्य स्वामी जी डॉक्टर स्वामी सदा से ही हमारे विश्वविद्यालय के लिए एवं विशेष तौर पर मेरे लिए प्रेरणा स्रोत रहे हैं डॉक्टर स्वामी के व्यक्तित्व की कुछ सबसे महत्वपूर्ण विशेषताएं हैं सत्य का आग्रह नवोमुखी सोच और भारतीय सभ्यता और संस्कृति से उनका गहरा जुड़ाव इंडस यूनिवर्सिटी नींव की डालते समय अपनी कार्यशैली में डॉक्टर स्वामी के इन गुणों का हमने अपनाने का पूरा प्रयास किया है हम अक्सर देखते हैं कि वैज्ञानिक और तकनीकी उत्कृष्टता चाह में हम अपनी संस्कृति धरोहर को भुला देते हैं पर इंडस यूनिवर्सिटी में पोस्ट बनाते समय और नए विभाग खोलने के समय हमने हमेशा ध्यान रखा छात्रों को विज्ञान और तकनीकी उत्कृष्ट शिक्षा देने के साथ साथ हम उन्हें अपने सांस्कृतिक मूल्यों से भी अवगत कराया जाए इस यात्रा में डॉक्टर स्वामी के विचार और जीवन हमारे लिए मार्गदर्शक साबित हुए हैं मुझे आज अत्यंत हर्ष हो रहा है कि डॉक्टर स्वामी आज स्वयं हमारे बीच में हैं पर मार्गदर्शन करने के लिए बता रहे हैं हमें यह अवसर प्राप्त हुआ है इसके लिए हम हृदय से उनका स्वागत करते हैं धन्यवाद थैंक यू सर टू इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर स्वामी इज अ मैमथ टास्क 
We at Indus University will attempt to give you a glimpse of this distinguished personality who has close to 85 lakh followers on social media. <laughs> Dr. Swami is a statistician, an economist, a politician, a lawyer, an educationist, and more than any of this, he is a hero for millions of Indians. An exceptional statesman, Dr. Swami, has been elected to the parliament several times due to his unblemished political career and his fierce battle against injustice of all forms. His strong ideological convictions are a beacon of inspiration, not just for aspiring politicians, but also for us civilians. As he constantly strives to strengthen the core of concepts of democracy and economic development of India. He earned his doctorate in economics from Harvard in 1964, after his research with two Nobel laureates, Simon Kutznitz, universally acknowledged as a father of econometrics, and Paul Samuelson. He immediately joined the ranks of faculty member in the Department of Economics at Harvard, making him the youngest faculty to teach at Harvard. <laughs> Under the able guidance of the exceptional scientist J.B.S. Haldane, Dr. Swami wrote his first paper, Note on Fractal Graphical Analysis, a critique disapproving Mahalunobis' claims of originality for his own statistical invention. Dr. Swami has been among the earliest to advocate economic liberalization and competitive market economy for India. As Union Commons Minister from 1990 to 91, he prepared the blueprints for economic reforms adopted by the then successor Narsimha Rao government. Dr. Subramanian Swami is a published author of several books, research papers and journals. He received Distinguished Alumni Award from Hindu College University of Delhi in 2012. Hindu Ratna Award from the Organization of Hindu Helpline 2013 and Tamil Rat Ratna Award for Tamil Sangam from New York. He was ranked 25th in the Indian Express 2017 list of most powerful Indians. Dr. Swami embodies the ideology of, if not me, then who? As he single-handedly raised issues pertaining to identity and Indianness by arguing petition in person cases. He has played crucial roles in cases namely the Ram Setu case, the Ram Janmabhumi case, reopening of Kailash Man Sarovar pilgrimage and the Natraj temple case. He was also instrumental in restoring India-Israel relations and India-China relations. At last, I would like to say that more than anything, Dr. Swami's life journey is characterized by absolute fearlessness, which comes from his personal integrity and conviction. Ladies and gentlemen, let us have a thunderous applause for Dr. Subramanian Swami. May I now request Dr. Nagesh Bandari, President of Indus University, to extend a floral welcome to Dr. Subramanian Swami. <laughs> Indus University has always endeavored to push the envelope in terms of defining the utility of education. At Indus University, education is about questioning and finding answers to theoretical constructs and practical experiences. Indus University has gone beyond engineering, aviation, design, and humanities to bring into its fold Indus Institute of Special Studies through Center of Indic Studies. The Center of Indic Studies is spearheaded by Sri Ram Sharma, who has also been instrumental in planning this distinguished lecture. I invite Mr. Ram Sharma to give us an insight into the ideation and execution of who we are, a quest for national identity. Mr. Ram Sharma. Namaste. My sadhar pranam to our honorable chief guest, Dr. Subramaniam Swami. A very warm welcome to our esteemed guests on dais, respected senior members of Indus University, my friends, and dear students. It's an honor and privilege for me to introduce the topic on which Dr. Swami is going to deliver his lecture. When Dr. Swami accepted our invitation and wanted us to share the topic, it was not an easy task for us to narrow down and finalize one topic out of a wide range of expertise he commands, and also to fulfill the expectations of his admirers and followers who would like to him to speak on a number of subjects. So let me share two reasons for you for selecting this topic. Our first reason is related to the major problem we are facing today. And let me spell out the characteristics of this problem before naming it. We as an Indian 
are collectively suffering from a very deep national crisis. This crisis is at the foundation of other major problems we are facing, be it economical, political or social. This crisis has made our dominant section of intelligentsia disconnected from our roots and hence disoriented, rudderless and confused. I am talking about most of the dominant intelligentsia. This crisis is responsible for weakening our national security. Various forces are waging a proxy war against us without our being aware of it. And that is the sad part of it. This crisis has brought intellectual poverty to India. Remember, we were, as a country, we were exporter of ideas till the arrival of British. And now we have, what we have become? An importer of ideologies. Ideologies that have been rejected and have become obsolete and outdated in the country where they originated. But we are embracing them in the name of modernism and progressivism. And it's not surprising that we are not contributing any original ideas in the global domain, except few jugad here and there. And this crisis is also responsible for us for a monetary loss. We are losing billions of dollars in those areas where India has core expertise and far ahead of any other nation on this globe. And particularly at a time when the world is looking at us for a lasting and deeper solution for a global problem we are facing. This crisis is at the root of our colonized psyche. Isn't it strange that our minds are still colonized after 70 years of independence? Or that remind me of Dr. Swami's own words that today India is free but not independent. And what is this national crisis we are talking about? How to define it? How to name it? We, Indians, are facing an identity crisis at a very deeper level. It is a loss of national identity. We are all collectively suffering from cognitive dissonance. We are physically located in India, but mentally somewhere else. Majority of us are not even aware of who are we. What does India stand for? What does it mean when you say that you are an Indian? We cannot spell out that even very properly. One important reason for this identity crisis is the loss of memory. Or in our particular case, it's a loss of national memory. We have been made to completely forget our past. We have reached a stage where we have completely forgotten that what made India once a great civilization. Why we were at one point of time an intellectual powerhouse and exporting brilliant, of, brilliant ideas. Why students from across the world would come to India for learning? We have completely forgotten how we became the largest economy in the world before the arrival of British. And that too, remember, that too, not built on either socialist model or capitalist model. That we had is a very, very unique model, very sustainable model, rooted in our dharmic ethos. Unfortunately, we are rarely taught about these great achievements of our country and of course there is no space for learning about the great minds of India who laid the foundation for it. And the most damaging consequence of this culturally induced ignorance is that we are producing a generation of self-hating and self-alienating Indians. Being a teacher, it's very painful and tragic to see that Every year, millions of students are coming out from our educational institutions without being aware of their national identity, without being aware of who they are. On the contrary, if you ask them what is wrong with India, I think they will spell out an almost an endless list of grievances. And what's the lasting impact of this asymmetrical knowledge regarding India? Our students are completely disconnected from their roots thoroughly uninformed about vast intellectual heritage we have, simply ignorant about the amazing treasure of indigenous knowledge system we have in our country. And it is resulting in nothing but in collective amnesia, inducing permanent guilt among Indians for being an Indian. Or to conclude this introduction, I must say that, and to borrow phrase from our own tradition, 
we are all suffering from hanuman syndrome and what that refers to it refers to a stage when hanuman ji was aware, unaware of his hidden potential and capacity due to curse and finally jamwan ji made him realize his true potential and aroused him from his deep slumber and that made hanuman ji to finally accomplish extraordinary feat later on so today we need someone like jamwan ji who can wake us up from our deep slumber to unleash our collective hidden potential and for us today dr swami is our jamwan ji he has been raising awareness about this particular issue for a very very long time he has written extensively on this particular subject who are we and this is our second reason for selecting this topic therefore i request dr swami and invite to please show us the way to overcome this national crisis thank you sir a respected president of this university members distinguished members of university society and the faculty and students professors the audience i have been uh, asked to speak on the subject of who we are this is not a unique thing for our country in terms of the fact that many countries have been now discussing this question of who we are in the united states at harvard university there was a professor called samuel huntington who wrote a, a book called who are we and he came to the conclusion to the surprise of everybody that we are a nation of white anglo-saxon protestants english speaking people so there was a sh shock in most people and they said we have mexicans we have indians we have chinese we have italians we have all kinds of people in our society and you are saying uh, we are white anglo-saxon english speaking uh, christian population how is this the identity now samuel huntington himself was not a christian he was a professor of, uh, of uh, government and a jew he was the jewish community so he said the question of nationality and the question of identity national identity are two different things United States was started by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant English speaking people and therefore that shall remain the 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 identity of our country but others can be citizens of the country similarly british prime minister was asked about the not this prime minister but the uh, much earlier he was asked this question by bbc what is the identity of britain and he said we are a white christian country again the same question was asked that we have uh, indians pakistanis all kinds of people then he again said it was founded as a christian country and that is the identity what you are talking of is about is the citizenship of the united kingdom today when we discuss our country's identity we must know first of all what our correct history is and professor shama was right in saying that now the problem in our country is we don't know who we are because the british wrote history books and they were interested in creating the impression that we are not or ever were a the country we were a, a a conglomeration of of kings who were fighting with each other then somebody came from abroad first the dravidians were ruling this country then the aryans came from khyber pass then the muslims came then the british came this is a country essentially created by invaders and it has no identity of its own and this has been taught for 
many years, even after independence, because we did not change the history books prepared by the British. In Jawaharlal Nehru University, most of these people were there. But don't worry, it's not going to be very long before Jawaharlal, Jawaharlal Nehru University is reconstituted. <laughs> but the truth is, now many scholars have come to the scene to bring about scientific evidence to contradict this British version of history. One of them is very known to you, he is Rajiv Malhotra. He is a man who is not a historian, he is not a university scholar. He was a top level executive of a telecom company and he resigned it at the age of 43 and devoted his life to rewriting the correct history of India. And therefore, you are privileged that you have a person like him coming regularly here. When he comes here again in February, I hope to have a chance to also be here present with him because he's a good friend of mine. <laughs> now, first of all, how old is our civilization? And this civilization is essentially a continuing civilization. It is not broken. UNESCO listed 46 civilizations this world has seen and concluded that 45 have disappeared. For example, the Greek uh, civilization has disappeared. Today's Greece is not the ancient Greece. Roman civilization has disappeared. Today's Italy is not that Roman civilization. Uh, Egyptian civilization of the pharaohs, that is not today's Egypt. Today Egypt is a Muslim country. Mesopotamia, Babylon. And they went on listing all these civilizations which are now died. Uh, died. And something new has come in its place. And said 45 of the 46 civilizations have now disappeared. Only one civilization is a continuing civilization from time immemorial, and that is the Hindu civilization of India. <laughs> By Hindu civilization, I'm not excluding anybody. They are all parts of this country guaranteed an existence here under the constitution of India. But the civilization that the history records is that of the endeavor of the Hindus throughout the centuries. We were the most developed country in the world. For a long time, till 1700, we were the richest country in the world. After that, the Chinese took over for a brief period, and then the Industrial Revolution came in Europe, and then the British, then the French, the Germans, and finally in the 20th century, the Americans with their innovations, took the lead, and they are still in the lead. So I am talking about the civilization that we had. We must know what it was. First of all, the British historian's statement about Aryans and Dravidians, it has no basis at all. The word Dravidian was first used by Adi Shankara. When he started from Kerala, when India was mostly Buddhist and he decided to revert the country back to Hindu religion with Buddhist principles accommodated and assimilated. So he went from scholar to scholar, Buddhist scholar, from Kerala all the way to Srinagar in Kashmir, challenging scholars to a debate, which was called Shastrat in, in Sanskrit. Which means, he said, if I win the debate, then you must convert to my school of thought. And if I lose the debate, I will convert to your school of thought. And he won all the way up to Kashmir. And that's how the Buddhist civilization was transformed into a pan-Indian, pan-Hindu civilization of India because of Adi Shankara. At one place in Bihar, when he met the most foremost scholar of, 
of Buddhism and Uttaramimamsa school, uh, Mandana Mishra, he challenged them. So Mandana Mishra decided that he would, de uh, he would debate with them. But Mandana Mishra was the greatest scholar of that time. And uh, Shankara, Adi Shankara was the greatest scholar of Hindu, Hindu, Hindu theology. And who will be the umpire? So Adi Shankara said, your wife can be an umpire. And she became the umpire. And finally, she declared her husband as loser. And he became the first Shingre, Shankaracharya of Shingeri by conversion to the Advaita school of, uh, of Adi Shankara. At that time, the first question asked of Adi Shankara was, who are you? He said, I am Dravida Shishu. That is the first time the word Dravida came. Shishu, you can understand, child. But Dravida, he said, is a sandhi of two words, three, tra and vid, which means where the three uh, coastlines meet. And that is South India, where the three coastlines meet, one of the, from, because of the Indian Ocean, Kanyakumari and others, then the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. And so Travid became Dravid, and Dravid is being used today in, the, in Tamil Nadu as if it's a separate race, because the British historians say, first the Dravidans ruled India, and then the Aryans came through Khyber Pass, beat the Dravidians to the south, became Aryan and Dravidian. Now, this is a history which should be rejected from all our history books. It is still being taught, unfortunately. There is no racial basis for this. Why is there no racial base, basis? Because if you look at the DNA of Indians today, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from, from Jamnagar to, uh, to Dibrugad in Assam, all Indians have the same DNA according to the research that has come out in the modern journals of uh, genetics. Cambridge University uh, publication shows that we are the same people. That means everything about us is the same. Brahmins and scheduled caste have the same DNA. North Indians, South Indians have the same DNA. Even Muslims and Indians and Hindus have the same DNA. I challenged once uh, in a TV debate, uh, OYC, when he said that we are a distinct people, I said, you are not. He said, how do you know? I said, you come with me to the microbiological laboratory and I will test your DNA and my DNA. <laughs> and he said, where is that? I said, it is in your hometown, Hyderabad. So you can be very, very comfortable there. But he has never agreed to come because he's afraid to find out the truth that his DNA and my DNA is the same. So I am saying to you today that there is no difference between any Indian. Yes, in the peripherals, in the uh, uh, Arunachal area, there will be some, uh, some versions of the Mongoloid thing, but that's a very small percentage. Overwhelming percentage of Indians all have the same DNA, whether you're a Gujarati or a Tamil or a Bengali or a Kashmiri, all our DNA is the same. Whether you are a Brahmin or a scheduled caste or you are a Kshatriya or a, or a Shudra, your DNA is the same. And that is proved in Gita in chapter 4, when Krishna tells uh, Arjuna that Kshatriya is a value. It is not your birth, it's a guna. All these four categories of Hindu, Brahmin, uh, Kshatriya, Vaicha and Shudra, they are gunas. That is, if you are a Brahmin, you must be a Jnani and Tyagi. Even though Ra Mahatma Gandhi was born in a Vaishya family, but because he was a Jnani and a Tyagi, he qualifies to be a Brahmin, and that is the correct definition of a Brahmin. Not somebody who is born in a Brahmin family necessarily. Vishwa Mitra was born in a Kshatriya family. He became Rishi of Rishis. Same thing with uh, Veda Vyasa. Veda Vyasa's mother was a fisherwoman. Kali Dasa was a Vanavasi. 
He was cutting tree, woods of tree before he was trained to become a poet and became a Mahakavi, the Maharishi. Similarly, Valmiki was born in a scheduled caste family. Those days, there were a very small number who were, who were uh, treated as uh, not part of society. But their children were not treated as a part, not a part of society. And Valmiki is the example. He started off as a, as a Daku and then later on it got converted and he became a Maharishi and wrote the Navayan. And we worship him as a Maharishi. It's not necessary that if you are a Brahmin, you cannot cease to be a Brahmin. Ravan was a Brahmin. And he fought a Kshatriya, Rama, and Rama killed him. But the country's Brahmins did not condemn Rama for it. They worshipped Rama for it because he killed an evil man. It didn't matter whether he was a Brahmin or not. So today we have to develop this concept that we are all Indians. We have to be united. In the olden days we were united by language. One language called Sanskrit. And then the British came, they burnt all the Sanskrit libraries. They ensured that you all learned English. And today English is not a British language. It has now become an international language thanks to America. So I am not against learning English. But sooner or later, we will have to bring back Sanskrit as the link language of India. Why? Because of two reasons. All Indian languages have a huge percentage of Sanskrit words. You take any language, you will find Sanskrit words in it. Some more, some less. Malayalam has 75% of its words are from Sanskrit. Bengali is 80% from Sanskrit. Gujarati is 65% from Sanskrit. Kannada is 60%. Even Tamil has 40% Sanskrit words. Once I had a debate with, uh, with uh, Karnanidhi on this, who was a very strong believer that Dravidian is a separate race. And I told him that and he, uh, he abused the Sanskrit in, with me. I will, he said, I will never accept Sanskrit. I said, why? He says, because of foreign language, it is Aryan language. I said, but your name is also Sanskrit. Karuna Nidhi. These are Sanskrit words. And I gave him more examples. The, his election symbol in Tamil is called Udayan Suryan, rising sun. Udayan Suryan. I asked him, why are you calling it Udayan Suryan? Uday is Sanskrit. Surya is Sanskrit. And what is your symbol called in Tamil? Chinnam. And in Sanskrit it is called Chin. So he said, no, no, the Sanskrit must have stolen it from Tamil. I said, doesn't matter, it is common to both of us. Please accept it. And slowly he began to accept. But it was too late. And then God called him back. But he had a habit of, of uh, disparaging everything about the North. He said, I will never accept Ram Chandraji. Why? I said, he's a northern, Aryan. How can I accept him? He killed a Dravidian. Our Dravidian god called Ravan. So I said, Dravidian go? You mean uh, Ravan was from here? He said, yes, from Sri Lanka. I said, no, Ravan was born near Delhi in Noida, in a town, in a village called Bisrak. Please go and see there. You will see there, you will put a board. This is the village of Ravan. Ravan went to Kailash and Mansarovar. He did prayers there. Shiva gave him a boon. With that boon, he came and conquered Sri Lanka. And I said, Ravan is not at all your Aryan. He's, he's an Aryan also, by your definition. And you call him your man. And he used to celebrate Ravan Leela whenever we celebrated North uh, Ram Leela. But after I convinced him, he, has stopped, uh, he stopped uh, celebrating Ravan Leela. So this, this, this is what the British fed into our brain. And we have to get it out. There's no difference in any, any you know, Brahmins are brainy people and scheduled castes only do menial work. None of that kind. Ambedkar was a scheduled caste. He was educated by a Brahmin teacher called Ambedkar. In fact, Ambedkar's original name was Bhim Rao Ram Singh. 
and it was not for Ambedkar. It is Ambedkar, the Ambedkar, the teacher who told Ambedkar Bhim Rao that you are a very bright fellow. You must go abroad and learn and get a PhD. And therefore, there will be resistance to you because of the fact that you are from scheduled caste. So take my name. And that's how he became Bhim Rao Ambedkar. He went to Colombia and studied there, got a PhD in economics. Went to L London, got a DSC, Doctor of Science in Economics. Then he got, became barrister. He got a law degree. Came to India and became the chairman of the drafting committee of the Constitution. He was a scholar. Even though he was from, was from scheduled caste, because he got a good education, he became the best in our country. And many people from the so-called Pandit families, they were no match for him. Jawaharlal Nehru was a Pandit. He went to Cambridge and failed in the exam there. And they called him Pandit, but they never called Bhim Rao Ambedkar as Pandit. So this prejudice is what you have to get out. You have to now work into your mind that we are all Indians from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from Jamnagar to Dibrugar. We are all Indians and nothing else. Indians first, then only we are Gujaratis, then only we are Marathis, then only we are Tamils. Now, the British told us a lot of lies. They said there's no such thing as Dwarka. But now we have found Dwarka is there. It has gone underwater as it is predicted in, in Puranas. And now there has been, there had been an effort to take it up, but there is still a lot of work to be done. They said there is no such river as Saraswati, because Rig Veda has so many references to Saraswati but very, very little reference to Ganga. So they said, look at this imaginary river called Saraswati and you're praying to it. Now, after digging, we find Saraswati has gone underground. It has been now located and very soon Saraswati will again flow over ground all the way from the mountains through Gujarat into the Bay of Bengal, into the Arabian Sea. So this is again a proof. So many things we said, your uh, um, Dholavira is another example. These excavations that have been found in originally in West pa in pa now what is called Pakistan. That is not part of our culture. That is not so. It is now so that Harappa civilization goes down to as, as far down as Tamil Nadu. It was a civilization that because of, uh, of uh, the fact that the river changed course, these civilizations evaporated. They were part of our civilization. This has to be corrected now in our history books. Similarly, uh, Ram Setu. When uh, uh, the British came here, they renamed it as uh, Adam's Bridge. And it was known as Adam's Bridge in our book. Then one day, the government decided that they want to take ships not around Sri Lanka to go from Kanyakumari to Chennai, but go through the water between Sri Lanka and, and the Indian coast. But unfortunately, Ram Setu, or what the British called as Adams Bridge, was in the way. So they decided to cut through it. So Karunanidhi celebrated, he told the Muslim community, they demolished uh, a Babri Masjid, I will demolish Ram Setu for you. Uh, so, well, he could not. He got demolished instead. So, what happened? They created a Setu Samudram project. And they wanted to demolish it. Many people went to court to try and oppose it, but the Supreme Court didn't agree. Finally, the Ashok Singhal of the Vishwanda Parishad and Sudarshan of the RSS, they came to me and said, you must take it up. And I didn't know how to take it up, but then I said, I believe in Lord Rama. If he wants to save it, he'll put it in my head how to save it. So I went to the court, and the court asked me, why have you come on the same matter? We have already dismissed it. I said, you dismissed it because you didn't accept the religious principle. I have come here to say that this project is going to cost 3,000 crores, only so that the ships don't have to go around Sri Lanka. I am giving you another project 
which is put a railway line from Kanyakumari along the coast all the way to, to, uh, to Chennai, and that is 600 crores as opposed to this is 3,000 crores. So this is cheaper, and therefore the government should not use this expensive project, but use this cheaper project. And I won the case. But even then, the court's uh, judge, one of the judges, his name was Ravindran, he said to me, who will go to the middle of the ocean and pray? He asked me. Why are you making such a fuss about this Ram Setu? So I said, every morning I pray to Lord Surya, but I don't go to Surya and come back. Because in our concept, we can pray from a distance also. Of course, we can always go to Ram Setu. Now, I'm hoping that very soon the Prime Minister will declare that uh, uh, Ram Setu is a national heritage monument and the government will make it possible for you to go, go there. And you also, if the Prime Minister comes here, tell him to do it quickly. Otherwise, I'll have to go to court again, like for Ram Temple. So, I'm saying these are things which are come from our history, we are now seeing it. And therefore, I'm asking you that whether in our country we should allow our differences to bog us down. No matter which part of the society you come, we are all equal and how we should go forward, that is the important thing. And therefore, I would say that we have to now recognize that we are under threat. The whole world wants us to uh, believe that uh, we are not the ancient Hindu civilization, that we are a new country. We are not a new country. We are a new republic, but we are not a new country. Our national identity is the same. We are culturally one people. We should be one people. There were attempts made to separate us culturally. Culturally, you can be one country. Our identity, like the American identity and the British identity, is this is a Hindu civilization. Unlike other civilizations, it's a continuing civilization. And many others have joined us. They've contributed to us. But when Ganga flows, so many rivers join on the way. But the Ganga is known as Ganga right up to the Bay of Bengal, and it has, doesn't go by any other name. So the same way, the Hindu character of this country, no matter the fact that we have... Uh, Zoroastrians are here. Look at the great tradition of ours. The great tradition of ours is that the Parsis, who are known as Parsis here, li uh, lived in big numbers in, in Navsari. They came because of Islamic invasion of Persia. So they came to our country and the people of Gujarat gave them a place to stay and many of them from Sanjan went to Navsari and then they became very important members of our society. We have a chief justice who, we had a chief justice who was a Parsi, we had an attorney general who was a Parsi, we had a commander in chief of the army like Manik Shah who was a Parsi, we had a Air Force chief Fali Major who was a Parsi. We have Parsis everywhere and they have flourished. And when the British came to this country and then were leaving, they told the Parsis, we want to give you reservations in the, in the future constitution of India. We will ensure that we will speak to Gandhiji and see that uh, Parsis are given like Anglo-Indians the reservation. You know what the Parsi community said? For thousand years the Hindus have protected us. We don't need you. You go back home. We are quite safe here. <laughs> Similarly, the Jews, they came, they were cut and they were, horrible atrocities were committed on the Jews all over the world. But they, when they came to India, we gave them a place, we built them their synagogues, their, their temples in Cochin, in Bombay, and they lived happily here till the Israel was founded, and then they, many of them went back to Israel. And Israel parliament passed a resolution, and the first resolution they passed is, thank you India, the only country where the Jews were not persecuted. And today, we are giving lectures by, you know, Hindu, uh, Hindus are intolerant, Hindus are this, Hindus are that, by all these westernized intellectuals of our country. So this is the thing that you have to learn. This is our history. We have treated our women the best 
in the entire history of any country. You find out whether how what was the women's position. Mahabharat took place because one woman's sari was taken off. A, max, a war took place where entire country participated in that war, and those who were who were the perpetrators, they were defeated. What about uh, why was Ravan killed? Because he kidnapped uh, Sita, and if Rama was a raja. He could have married any number of times, but he married only once. And for her, he went all the way to Sri Lanka and, and finished off Ravan and brought her back. Similarly, in other situations, you'll find women have equal positions. In fact, sometimes they, I feel women have got better positions. When I was looking at Brahma's cabinet, I found all the important portfolios were being held by women. I found uh, uh, defense was with Durga. Finance was with his Lakshmi and education was with Saraswati. So I asked uh, an Acharya, what about male gods? There are no portfolio. He said, yes, one portfolio, information broadcasting to Narad Muni. <laughs> this is our tradition. Rani Jhansi. Can you have, have you, do you know any other country where women have led armies? This is not only an exception. In Karnataka, Rani Chennama, she also led all through, or they were advisors, like Shivaji's mother, she used to advise him on strategy. This is the position women had. We lost it because of these invasions that took place. And now we need to re re restart the whole thing. We are the most developed country in the world. We were the most intelligent people in the world. We produce mathematics, we produce science, surgery, so medicines, all kinds of things. People from all over the world used to come. That pride you must have. And that pride of being one Indian. That must come and see that the world attempts to divide us and create division and to give a bad name to any praise of Hinduism, you will get a bad name as, an, as a communal man, as an obscurantist, as a man who wants to kill the minorities. How can a country which looked after minorities like the Parsis and the Jews and the Syrian Christians. Why should we be doing this? Certainly, when we were attacked, we had to attack back. We fought. India is the only country which kept fighting, fighting, fighting till it got liberation. Take the case of the Parsis, the, the Zoroastrians who were ruling uh, Persia. Uh, Islam invaded uh, uh, Persia and took over that country and converted 100% of the population uh, to Islam. Only a few survived, they came to India and survived. Similarly, Babylon, Mesopotamia, these countries which are now known as Iraq, they in, in uh, 17 years, they converted the entire population to Islam. Egypt was converted in 21 years. The, the Christians converted Europe in 50 years to 100% Christians. But in this country, there was a war was waged for 600 years with Islam and 200 years with Christians to the British, and yet we are 82% Hindu. What does that mean? <laughs> so therefore, I was saying that you have to recognize the unity of this country. We are, we have a constitution. We did not do all this drama about secularism when the Constituent Assembly met Rajendra Prasad was the president of the Constituent Assembly. Sardar Patel was the chairman of the Fundamental Rights Committee. And Ambedkar was the chairman of the drafting committee. They debated whether we should include secularism in our constitution. And all the entire Constituent Assembly decided that secularism is a term used in Europe by Martin Luther, Reverend Martin Luther, to say separation of the state and religion. The church should not intervene in the affairs of the state. That was the meaning of secularism. And it's not appropriate for India, because in India we have never allowed, in throughout our history, before the Mughals came, or the Islamic forces came, except for Ashoka, who said only a Buddhist can be a king of India. 
No other, nobody else, no Hindu king ever or, or any of the Hindu Shastras ever mentioned that only a Hindu can be a king of India. So they said, what is the need? We are a religious society. Hindu religion believes that all religions lead to God. No other religion believes that. Of course, I'm, when I say Hindu, I include a Buddhist, Sikhs, a Jains in, in that category. Because the constitution also defines that way. It's a Hindu is a, is a cultural concept. It's, it's a geographical concept. But we did not ever discriminate against anybody else's religion. Islam believes that either you believe in Allah or you are a kafir. Christianity says either you believe in Christ or you are possessed by the devil. And they do not accept that all religions lead to God. Islam does not accept all religions lead to God. The only religion in the whole world which believes that all religions lead to God, and that is Hindu religion and no other religion. <laughs> this is a fact. It is a question of, but at the same time, we believe in coexistence, so therefore this country all religions can prosper. You can have a mosque here, you can have a church here, nobody will object. But you see, in Arabia, Saudi Arabia, we have got 20 lakhs, 20 lakhs people in Saudi Arabia as workers, 20 lakhs. They will not allow you to build a temple. They will not allow you to celebrate Diwali. They will not allow you to even have Satyanarayan Puja inside your house. If your luggage carries a picture of Ram Chandraji, they will take out that Ram Chandraji and break it and step on it. That, they say, is our religion. But we are not like that. We have never been like that. So therefore, to take pride in our past doesn't mean Hindu fanaticism or Hindu communalism or anything. This is our past, where we became the most developed country in the world. And therefore, we must know this is what we are. We are those people who have descended from rishis and munis and from great warriors who have protected this country, fought for it, and kept fighting till the invader left. That is the country that we want to build today. And we want to build today on the basis of constitution. Constitution, Mrs. Indira Gandhi brought in the, during the emergency the, the word secularism, otherwise it was not there. What is there in, secular, in the constitution? It is faith. Faith is there. And that is what I used in the Supreme Court to win the Ram Mandir case, which, uh, which was going on and on. And I said, these people who are fighting are fighting for property, whether it is, it is a uh, Sunni Wakaf board property or whether it is a Ram Janmabhumi Nyas Samiti's property. I have come here to say, my faith says that Ram was born in that spot and therefore there shall be a temple there because faith is higher than the right to property. And that is why the Supreme Court gave us the victory. So we are people of that faith and we believe everybody's faith is equally viable and equally relevant. And on that basis, we have maintained our country's democracy. When the attempt was made to take away our democracy, our people fought, and the Gujaratis fought the best of all, because abroad, when I went there to, to propagate against the emergency, the maximum support I got was from the Gujarati people of America. And I can tell you a secret, I'm a Jamai of Gujarat, because my wife is a Parsi, and she's from Ahmedabad, so therefore, I am totally one with you on this and I want to say to you, very bright future awaits for India. We are now going to become a world power once again and in that effort, go ahead, fight with unity and pride in your country, knowing who you are. Thank you very much. Let us have a huge round of applause for Dr. Subramanian Swami. A standing ovation. Thank you, sir, for your insightful and enlightening talk, a, a history lesson, I would say.
I'm sure it has left the audience mesmerized with a gamut of wit, eloquence, together with a sense of being citizens of India. Thank you very much, sir. It is indeed an honor to have you here. I now invite Dr. Pankaj Saxena, Associate Professor, Center for Indic Studies, for the launch of IKS module, an indigenous endeavor by Indus University. Thank you. It is indeed a great privilege and honor to introduce this course in the esteemed presence of Dr. Subramanian Swami and honorable dignitaries on the stage. We seek your blessings in this endeavor, sir. Every great nation teaches the core essentials of its civilization to its students. It is meant to give every student a notion about the path-breaking ideas, greatest scholars, and best works that were produced in that civilization. Unfortunately, Students in India are neither taught about the essential cultural elements of Indian civilization, nor about the scientific innovations and technological inventions contributed by Indians. Many great scholars, thinkers, and leaders have emphasized the need to include the great heritage of India's knowledge traditions in educational curriculum. Noted author, Indologist, and Padma Shri recipient, Professor Michel Danino observes, and I quote, clearly as a nation, we have not done justice to Indian knowledge systems, which no Indian university today teaches, except for a fragment here and a snippet there. Many scholars have demanded a place for the best of classical knowledge to be given due place in our academic spaces to no effect as yet." Unquote. Scientist, author, and Padma Shri awardee, Professor Subhash Kak notes, I quote, there is a rising voice in the West for re-emphasizing a classics-based curriculum that includes the earliest texts of the Western tradition. Educators in India have also begun to speak of a similar classics-based curriculum for India, although there hasn't been much of a follow-up and new universities merely copy the Western curriculum." Unquote. This failure to teach the students about the knowledge traditions and genuine history of India has resulted in a generation of confused, uprooted, and self-alienating youths who then become easy target for dangerous and predatory ideologies. And I might add that, uh, as Dr. Swami said, that India is the only continuous civilization which has continued from ancient antiquity to now, but India is the only major civilization which refuses even now to teach uh, about its knowledge tradition to its students. What we are seeing across our universities these days is a symptom of this deep-rooted problem in our education. The most important observation comes from Dr. Sami himself, and I quote, to understand his or her identity, the youth must know what their roots are, in particular, what is their affinity with other Bharatiyas and destiny of India. Thus, education must include curriculum to make the youth aware of what is India and in which direction the nation must move. At present, India's youth learn nothing on how to anchor their values except on unthinking adherence to the Western or European modes." Unquote. As observed by Dr. Swami, Indians today are struggling with an identity crisis or with uh, a Hanuman syndrome as expressed by my colleague uh, Ram Sharma. We are suffering from cultural amnesia. We have forgotten our very identity that who are we. This course of Indian knowledge system is an attempt by Center for Indic Studies, Indus University, to address this long felt concern to educate and guide our students in seeking and rediscovering the foundation for India's identity. This course will introduce students to the fundamental elements of Indian culture, its rich tradition of knowledge in multiple disciplines, and its achievements and contributions in various spheres. It will tell the students about India's most profound ideas and greatest innovations. It will make them aware of the ideas that India exported to the world. It will tell them what made India the intellectual powerhouse. It will help them understand the indigenous knowledge systems. This course is a series of lectures on India's intellectual, literary, artistic, social, scientific, and technological heritage. This course will comprise of 30 lectures of two hours each, divided into semesters. The subjects include the core essentials of India, Indian philosophy, Indian society, Indian arts, Indian languages and literature, Indian science and technology, Indian life sciences, Indian history, to name a few. Certificates will be provided at the end of every semester after the evaluation of the students. Acclaimed scholars and subject experts will also be invited to deliver guest lectures, giving the student the opportunity to learn from the great masters themselves. 
This course will be introduced in the upcoming academic session of Indus University. And I'm glad to share the fact, I cannot stress it more, that Indus University is the first university to offer this kind of course to its students in India. <laughs> this course is open for all who are interested. This course is an initiative of Center for Indic Studies, or the CIS. The CIS has been established with the goal of restoring the dharmic narrative of India. Our major activities are Indic Talks, Indic Courses, and Indic Varta. You can access them on our website, cisindus.org, and our YouTube channel, Center for Indic Studies. Uh, Dr. Swami's address that you just heard will also be uploaded on our YouTube channel very soon. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, now, I kindly request Dr. Swami and other dignitaries on the stage to formally launch the course, Indian Knowledge System. <laughs> Thank you. It's a matter of great delight for Indus University in, in this family that at the eminent hands of Dr. Swami, the course is being launched. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Among the things you can give and still keep are your word, a smile, and a grateful heart. To express our deep sense of gratitude towards our honorable chief guest for graciously accepting our invitation to be here today amongst us and gracing the occasion with his powerful presence, I request Dr. Nagesh Bhandari to felicitate Dr. Subramanian Swami. Let's have a huge round of applause for him. Thank you, sir. May I also request Mr. Anshul Bhavsar, along with his team of students from Indus Design School, to felicitate Dr. Swami with a portrait created by them. Thank you, students. Thank you, Anshu, sir. Thank you, sir.